Uh, endowment uh, and the mini print fund that have helped uh, sponsor this. Uh, Tanya over here has been in the print shop the last few days um, working on a print um, so please come up and uh, see that if you'd like. We'll be back there probably by about 9, 10 ish in the morning uh, and we've been kind of cranking that out. <laughs> so uh, Tanya Softik was born in Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina. She holds an undergraduate degree in painting at the Academy of Fine Arts of the University of Sarajevo and a graduate degree in printmaking at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. Her work is included in numerous collections in the United States and abroad, among them the New York Public Library, Library of Congress Print Department, and the New South Wales Gallery of Art in Sydney, Australia. Um, Softik, or Tanya rather, is currently a professor of art practice at the Department of Art and Art History at the University of Richmond, where she teaches printmaking, drawing, and the art of the book. And she lives in Richmond, Virginia. So please welcome Tanya Softik. Thank you, Justin, for this introduction and for bringing me here. And thank you all for coming, obviously. And very, very special thanks to amazing uh, dream team of the, of the girls in the printmaking studio. It's an all-women's team. We, are, we have gotten farther than I imagined in my wildest dreams would be on, on this Wednesday. And they're picking stuff up like this, which is, of course, tribute to Justin's teaching, but also tribute to just verve and intelligence and talent and hard work of these women. So I'm, I'm truly, truly enjoying um, being here. And it's not just the mountains with the sunshine. So because I haven't seen much of that, obviously, you know, but it's a great print shop, you know, so, uh, and I'm learning, you know, by spades. So, um, so I'm going to, this is not going to be ever since I was a little girl talk, I'm not going to go back, you know, throughout my career because it's getting long and longer as years pass by. Um, but I'm going to be rather talking about some of the main concepts in my work, relatively, relatively recent work. Um, and you know how I got here, how I'm continuing to be preoccupied with some things that I have been preoccupied with throughout my career, and how those things sort of, you know, build up. And whenever I'm talking to residencies, uh, to audiences, residencies, audiences that involve a number of students, I, I sort of, you know, like to also talk about detours and failures. So there will be a little bit of that as well, because I think the detours and failures are where some of the most important, as horrible as they feel at the time, is where um, some of our most important lessons happen. And, um, and so it was for me. So I'm starting um, this with, um, with one of the works from a cycle of migrant universe, which I have comp uh, I have worked on at somewhere between 2007 and 2013, 12 or 13, I'm not quite sure, and it is it's one of the largest cycles of work um, that I have ever done, and um, it's kind of an important um, important point in my career for a number of reasons. But um, you know, because images, the, the 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 individual pieces that make up this cycle, if you will, this collection of stories, if you will, um, kind of encapsulate some of the um, you know some of the main ideas. Um, in my work. So I will slowly go through, and this is, you know, as you can see, this is not print. Most of this is the work on paper. Some people refer to it as a painting, and some people refer to it as a drawing. And I, um, I, I, I think I have adopted this generic term, oh, it's a work on paper, so that I don't have to explain and think about. I notice that galleries like to say, paintings, you know, and, uh, and they're kind of nudging me when I'm giving a talk because I think that has something to do with pricing and desirability and anyhow, poor world that doesn't know the drawing is what it's all about. But <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what are the things that 
you know, I think about when I when I think about my work, and, and when I'm not thinking about why I work, but when I'm just thinking about the world. And one of the things that uh, um, are really important to me, I am a, I am a former refugee to this country from former Yugoslavia. Uh, there are some of you old enough in this room to remember that there was a lovely country of Yugoslavia. Justin has hitchhiked through it in his youth. Those were the days, um, you know, when it was uh, when it was cheap and the coast was uh, not empty but rather inexpensive, and you could live on pennies a day and eat wonderful tomatoes and local food and so on, and sort of be a student on the on the on the move and those days are over and uh, rampant rabid late capitalism is ravaging the Balkans as it has ravaged been ravaging the rest of the world so um, so I've arrived I arrived here in 1989 to go to graduate school by the time I was defending my MFA in spring of 92 I actually defended the day before bombing of Sarajevo started and the war in the 90s, you know, uh, that some of you may still remember news from um, in, the mid, in the early to mid 90s has started. So uh, and the number of things that, you know, have been very integral part of my early life. I left when I was 23, 22 years old. Um, you, uh, that have been really important parts simply do not exist, you know, anymore. And um, so, how we remember things, how we, what kind of stories we tell, you know, about our memories, and you know, memory in a general sense. You know, there are a lot of things that have memory. There's memory foam. There is there's memory of the you know material. There's a, there's a recorded memory. There is you know our own mnemonic remembering. You know, capacity. Um, but uh, one of the things that really, um, the moment when um, it kind of began, unfold, uh, began unfolding is some of the most, one of the most important um, concepts. You know, one of the one of the things that really intrigued me is in uh, 1999. I was a residence. I was in residence in Venice at uh, printmaking school there, School Inter Internationality Grafica, and after my residency I traveled through Italy and I went to Naples and Pompeii and Herculaneum and uh, which was just incredible <coughs> visit, you know, looking at the paintings and looking at that world that has vanished, you know, in you know, one day, and um, and then I had this fantastic fortune to see this exhibition on technology of Pompeii in the museum in Naples. I don't know if it's still that way, but it was just this most amazing museum where you kind of like go and look at the stuff and everybody, you know, the guards are smoking and yelling at each other. And so <laughs> it was a completely non-museum atmosphere, but there was something extremely alive about it in this a, muse a museum that was displaying this long vanished world's, you know, artifacts, technology, and so on. And at the same time as I was touring, I, I just happened to be reading this. I ran out of all of my readings and I found in English bookstore in Venice um, this book by Francis Yates, the British historian, um, uh, The Art of Memory. And it's a uh, I, I don't know if I can say that I recommend it or not recommend it. Uh, it. It's worth plowing through. It's the driest, you know, most scholarly text, you know, <laughs> I have banged my head through. But um, in it, she sort of traces uh, 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 traces the memory as, a, you know, as an art, as something to be practiced. And um, here's the... Uh, 19th century uh, painting of sort of imagined painting of the of the Cicero orating in the, um, in the Roman Senate. So um, okay, printmakers, you know this, but everybody else, um, did Romans have paper? That's 
Papyrus is papyrus. It's kind of in its own category. It's kind of like something like plywood. Um, but did they have paper? No. How long was there no paper in Europe? 1522. Hmm? 1522. Somewhere, you know, somewhere around there. Um, so what did you do if you were to give a long, involved, abstract, philosophical, political speech in the, um, in the Senate? You know, you, you, you cannot as well come with a whole bunch of clay tablets. That would be a whole lot of clay tablets because this orating at that time involved talking, you know, for maybe five, six hours. That was not unusual to speak, to deliver a full speech in complete sentences, in complete, um, in complete paragraphs, to win over politically by the skill of your oratory. Um, you know, nobody gives, Fidel Castro has died, nobody orates for six hours anymore. Um, so, uh, so, I'm sorry? The Senate does. The Senate does. Yeah, they have, yeah, occasionally when they want to hold the floor. Um, and uh, so at any rate, um, and they don't do it very well. Um, and they have the papers, and they haven't written it. It's all the work of their aides, and so on. It's a, it's a very sad situation. But uh, in, in, in Ad Heranium, which is, you know, basically talks about you know, the, the art of delivering a speech, he talks a little bit, uh, he talks quite a bit on how Roman orators were trained in the art of memory. Um, in the art of remembering um, what they were talking about. So, and at, at this time, it's useful to think about the Roman residential architecture, which is centered sort of like uh, centered around the atrium with the rooms, with the rooms around it. And um, and it is through reading of this book that I have learned of Ed Heranium. I wasn't aware of this practice before. And uh, Cicero describes um, this very visual way of remembering things. You remember, okay, so you remember delivering your speech as something like this. You walk through, you walk through this building, this edifice. Your entire speech is to be memorized as this building. And you go in from one room to another, exiting, you know, going to another room, entering the room. And each room in your mind, in, uh, you know, in your visual mind, you appoint with, uh, you appoint with uh, sort of these tableau vivants or still lifes of objects that are going to be not illustrating what you're going to be talking about, because that would be impossible anyway. These were political speeches. Um, uh, but you, you, um, you're appointed with these objects that are going to be triggers uh, that will help you remember. And that immediately resonated with me, because when I was studying English or Italian or Latin, whatever, you know, whatever foreign language I was studying, I remember associating these words visually with the objects that they reminded me of, and that is how, you know, that is how I would remember them. Same as some people, you know, associate numbers with a certain color, you know, for, you know, for some people, five is yellow, of course five is yellow, what else would it be? And everybody else is looking, you know, what are you smoking? And, um, <laughs> and so on. So, um, so the orators were trained to go from one room to another, observe and pick up their cues from these tableau vivants, from the way they have appointed the room, exit that paragraph, that part, or what, what, what have you, go into another room and so on. And uh, if you think about it, this is not unlike the way uh, computer circuitry work and that memory of the computer enters and exits and travels the paths and is stored in the various things. At any rate, I thought this was the best piece of information I have ever received in my entire life. And it, and it began really, it, it really um, started something for me. It started this idea that um, to really put something, uh, to really put something down, to really capture something, the concept, not you know, event or landscape or something like that. Um, 
it, it liberated me in a way to think about it as you know what you need is triggers you need to be working with the triggers rather than laboring to illustrate so um, yeah, and one of the uh, this is not touch screen I, you know um, so one of the things that and this you know the Sarton memory has you know survived as much of the much of the Roman um, culture and uh, Gre Greco-Roman culture writing um, and so on has survived through Arab cultures through um, um, and and through the monastic centers of learning because they were the only centers of learning for you know a while and one of the uh, and and what this is this is from um, Giotto's Scriveni Chapel um, in Padua the huge phenomenal cycle of um, you know of his work the dawn of the Renaissance um, if you will kind of a later dawn of the Renaissance I should you know I should say. But these are, the, these are the paintings done in Grisaille, um, you know, uh, uh, these are the paintings done in Grisaille that are in between, on the lower level, in between sort of the main panels, and in between these sort of illusionistic, you know, uh, paintings of the marble niches and so on. So one of the things that Cicero says about quality, um, what kind of quality you need to give to your visual triggers that you are going to be, you know, that, that will help you uh, memorize things is that they have to be strikingly ugly or strikingly beautiful. So here's the, um, um, here's on my right and your left is the charity and here's the greed, so two, you know, opposite. Look at the charity. Look at how beautiful she is. Look at that perfect, you know, bowl of fruit. Look at how beautiful her dress is and how wonderfully appointed her, you know, hair and this crown of decorations is. So one hand offers the fruit, um, um, if you will. The other one receives more from God Almighty, I suppose. And, uh, and, she, stands, um, and she stands on the you know, bags of gold and what, uh, whatever. And look at the greed, look at her ugly gesture, look at how the snake comes out of her mouth and bites, bites her um, in the forehead. Um, look at that weird ear, you look at her clutching her bag of gold and burning, you know, with envy here. So this is the Biblia pauperum, or the Bible for the poor. This is intended for mostly illiterate, right, population. Uh, how, do you, how do you teach people values? How do you get them to memorize what is right and what is wrong? And this is, you know, one of the ways, and there are many, many, many examples in Western painting of this, but uh, the strikingly beautiful or strikingly ugly is, um, uh, is what you need is, is what you need to have. Oops. So another concept. Um, this is also um, a work of paper um, <laughs> of mine, not not the print, and it's um, um, it's the title of it is Nomads Polyphony, and it's about six feet. Uh, it is about six feet across. And I have done it in the honor of Edward Said, the fellow, um, the fellow exile, um, when, he, uh, when he died, because his essay on exile was, you know, one of the bedrocks of my, uh, of my graduate, you know, school learning and further. And, you know, Edward Said was um, the professor of literature, um, former professor of literature at Columbia University. Um, who he has written the seminal essay on exile, I believe in 1974 is when he has written it and he talks about the, um, he, he, interestingly he talks about the refugees and exiles and migrants as a minority in the world. I don't know that that is true, you know, anymore. You know, the, the world population is moving very often without, um, without wanting so, and it will be doing that with rising of the sea levels and so on. 
um, in the future. But he talks about um, uh, he talks about uh, the reason it's called nomads polyphonies because he uses a lot of words from music because he was a very skilled musician himself and he calls the consciousness of an exile polyphonic you know where uh, you process everything if you will through the lens of your migrant experience you process you know everything is kind of mirrored and mirrored back from experience before experience now. And it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's something that I have described as sort of like st when you're standing in the water in a lake or in the, um, or in the sea and you're looking at your feet down in the water. And I don't know if you have that sense. I have that sense. I sort of, you're always looking at your feet and you know that they're part of your body, but they just somehow look different and the color of the skin is different. And you know that they belong to you. You can wiggle your toes and you know feel them, but they're somehow in a different world. And it's in a way, this is, you know, anybody who has migrated from uh, one very distinct culture to another knows this, you know, knows this feeling of feeling in between, you know, feeling. And, and I'm not necessarily talking about this as. Um, it can be tragic, but it is not necessarily tragic. It's sort of a different way of looking at the world. So the drawing started with me. Um, I was replanting this Nandina bush from my, um, in my garden from one place to another. So I lifted it up and I looked at it. And you will often see a lot of plant material here. And sometimes the particular plant is important. In this case, it is not is just sometimes things have the right gesture. Uh, sometimes, sometimes plants have the right gesture, and this right gesture, if you will, um, you know, happened, um, if you will, happened here. Um, the third thing that preoccupies me is the loss. Um, I was the youngest child, and not just in my nuclear family, but sort of in this broader family, you know, the, my father and his three brothers and like all the children, you know, we were all kind of hanging together. So it was not until later of my life that I had an experience of loss of somebody, not until I pretty much understood what death is. I was old enough, you know, to do that. and um, and. Maybe some months before I left um, Yugoslavia, and I didn't know that I, to go to graduate school that I have left for good, I, um, I remember sitting at the kitchen window and having coffee and looking through and kind of listening to the radio and the, and the news of economic and political decline and nationalistic discord in Yugoslavia sort of getting worse. And people are talking about, well, we just hope there's no war. We hope these people don't, you know, these idiots don't start firing guns as they, you know, as they did. And I remember looking through the window and thinking, everything is where it should be. How can there be a war? Um, it, it, it's an absurd, uh, absurd, illogical thought, obviously. But um, it was a sense, now I recognize it as a sense of somebody who is up to that point never experienced anything, if you will, like that. So what you're looking um, at here is the burning of Sarajevo Library. Um, some months after the war, uh, the war has started, on the August 9th, I think, I think August 16th, 1992, the forces, the separatist Serb for forces that have basically infiltrated Yugoslav National Army, and I'm not gonna go into that, but they have basically besieged the city. Sarajevo was under siege uh, for three and a half years, and it was the longest siege in, um, after Stalingrad in the you know, uh, 20th century, and uh, water, electricity, uh, gas, um, any kind of supplies to the city were cut, were cut off. Um, and um, what they have been doing is they have been, because Yugoslav National Army happened to have a lot of armored, you know, vehicles and munition um, that was designed not for the buildings, but for the um, destruction of such, you know, armored vehicles. And those were the, 
those were things that were being lobed onto the city. So something that is designed to destroy an armored vehicle is going to go through several walls of several buildings before it actually doesn't stop. So, um, <clears throat> so they say that um, as far as the as far as the um, artillery goes, that more rounds of ammunition were fired onto the city of Sarajevo than were fired in the entire Vietnam War, and that's an accomplishment. So just for the hell of it, and actually not just for the hell of it, but to further demoralize the population of the city um, and, um, a, a, and so on, they have decided to, um, to, bombard, to, to bombard the library. So you're looking at Bosnia and Herzegovina's national equivalent to Library of Congress. So um, I had a chance to, so millions and millions book of, of books have been burned. And I think there's an ongoing project in one of the libraries at Harvard where people are still you know, calling on anybody who has ever studied and done research in Sarajevo to come forth to bring their you know, photocopies or whatever they have had so that, um, so that something can be recovered. And actually, some stuff was recovered. You will see that later you know, in my talk. Um, I had a chance to speak to the, um, the book restorer you know, from the Sarajevo's library. Uh, at that time, he was working in temporary facilities, and he was one of the last people who left it. Because when libraries started burning, people ran to it. There was no water. There was no way to. So people kind of created these lines from the river and buckets, but that's not going to. Um, so, so what he was doing, and several people, they were running in. They knew where the most valuable manuscripts and you know, books were, and they, they were kind of running out with heaps of things in their hands until some, you know, until, and, and when the beam started falling, you know, and somebody started saying, get out, get out, no more book collecting, get out, you know, it's, um, it's over. He said he turned around and he thought that um, he was hallucinating because he saw these silver waterfalls running down the columns you know, of the library, and the later somebody, the engineer explained to him, you were not hallucinating. Um, the, this was Austro-Hungarians, uh, Austrians built this building, you know, Yugos the Bosnia used to be the, um, be the colony of the Ottoman Empire, and then in the 19th century, in Treaty of Berlin, as Ottoman Empire was deteriorating, it was given by some treaty to Austria, so, the war, the nationalist war, and so on. I mean, this is the part that, that has suffered com consequences of any other colonized country, right? So anyway, um, I don't know why my timer is going. I, it, it's going. Um, so um, so uh, Austrians were building you know, this building, and they were um, um, and they built very solid things. Um, so he said, the, he was told he was not hallucinating. The heat of the books burning on three or four floors above the main floor was so high that the lead that they were putting in between the floors to insulate for the humidity was melting and running down the columns. The, li the library has now been um, restored by actually by funds from Austrian government. You know, that was a, a, a bit of a gift, you know, to the city. But um, um, it's, you know, and if you ask any person in Sarajevo who, ha I, I haven't, uh, who has, I was here in the United States, who has lived through the siege, and when as you ask anybody what was the absolutely lowest point, what was the worst, worst day in the war, everybody will tell you the day when they burned the library. And after they burned it for seven days, the, like black crows, these um, ashes of the books were hovering over the city and slowly falling. If you happened to catch one, you would still see the ink uh, printed letters shimmering, and people tried to save them, but you know there was obviously no saving it. So this particular loss is emblematic of m many. I mean, 
and then there is Aleppo, and then there is uh, Bamiyan Buddhas, and then there is Iraq, and there, there's so on. Uh, so each conflict brings more and more of this memory, this destruction of our collective cultural memory. Um, and that is something obviously that preoccupies me. And then finally, there is the print process itself. And um, uh, so as I have told some people um, here, I have one class in terms of formal university education in printmaking. I was a painting major. Um, and sometime in the junior year, late junior year, I started doing some etchings and I sort of fell in love and that was, um, that was sort of it. I mean, I came in as a painter you know, to the graduate program in, um, at Old Dominion University, but pretty quickly I have migrated into the print studio. And there's a number of things that I love about printmaking. And I, when I tend to work in print, you know, every time I promise myself I'm going to make nice single plate black and white print, please, Lord, let me make a single plate print. It never works. Um, because here's something that I love about printmaking and that printmaking me allows it to do. I, I take this moment to say that I am not a Trekkie. So this is, um, you know that how the teletransporter, that tool, um, I haven't seen all the tr Star Trek things and so on, but I've seen enough to see a ton of episodes where, you know, they're using teletransporter to do something. Okay, can you tell me one episode in which they go wherever they're supposed to go, get discombobulated into cosmic plasma and then, you know, land somewhere, and they come back and everything's fine? Have you ever seen a single episode where something does not go well with a travel transporter? Then why are they standing there like this, like they're riding in the elevator with a stranger? Anyway, unrealistic. Um, so, uh, so um, you know, something always goes wrong, right? So I have found through printmaking that for me to understand my own images, to understand what the heck I'm doing, because I am not a conceptual artist. I cannot conceptual something and then say, okay, now I'm going to get, get it done. I would jump through the window. I couldn't do that. I have to be doing it in order to understand what's happening. So it's the discombobulation, the, uh, uh, you know, I sort of have to see my own ideas, my own thoughts, like, like you know, like when you get the, um, I don't know what you guys use the, you know, manuals for like kitchen appliances for, I use them to look at pictures and nothing else because pictures are fabulous and my, my favorite picture is the exploded view. Um, I like prints because, making prints because they provide me with that exploded view. So we're ju I'm just gonna wa walk you through some, um, I just, this is what we've been doing in the print shop, but for those of you who, who haven't seen it, uh, you print the different colors in print, obviously one after another and layer them. So, so it, you know, your, your print manifests itself to you in this kind of a gradual way. Um, so here's the, okay, so here's the first layer. Here comes the second layer. Oh, the beautiful face is Obviously not mine. It's Natsumi, who's an architect in New York City now, a former student um, and assistant. And um, so this is the second layer. Here comes the third layer. I've been mentioning Kathy Caraccio, the master printer in New York that I worked for and that I sometimes collaborate on when I'm doing the additions. There she is. Um, so here's the third layer. Never mind, you will never see the fourth layer, but come to the print shop and see. It's a great process, but hopefully, you know, hopefully you get, uh, hopefully you get the idea. It's, I actually have to deconstruct my image in order to really be seeing it. So even when I work, even when I don't work in print, that's, that's a bit of a way that I'm working um, in. 
Okay, so here's the, so I'm going to talk about like, these three, uh, briefly about these three bodies of work that I have mentioned. Here's the mind grant universe. I'm showing the slide, you know, kind of as a scale reference, and there I am moving back and forth. So, I'm, so I get fuzzy and uh, non-distracting, but I'm still giving a scale reference, right? So, um, okay, so I came up, you know, with this idea, I'm going to be doing that, and, you know, the summer was coming, and I was ready to... Uh, work and here comes the big failure part. So, see this, um, that piece is kind of more or less done, but see this piece here and then this is the part of it. I go to Virginia Center for Creative Arts, which is a wonderful residency I recommend, you know, about two hours from, two hours from Richmond. Um, there's something in the soil there, like ideas grow and it's magical. It's, you know, it's very simple bare bones residency, but it's the place where I, have, I feel have done some, some of my best work. I'll be happy to talk to you about it until I'm blue in the face, especially because I'm on the fellows board there now. Um, but anyway, see that piece? Okay, so that is what? It's, uh, it's five, uh, it's 20 feet across, so each of these panels is five by five feet. It's the paper that is mounted on the panel. And um, um, so I get on it and I start working on it. And, uh, and as you can see, I'm working a little bit. I'm kind of informed when I do these things. I'm informed very much by my printmaking process. Okay, so I have worked on that sucker all summer long. Then the fall started. I have worked on it, you know, all fall long as I could, you know, while teaching. And it just wasn't working. And I kept digging into it. And I kept working on it. And I kept working on it. And I kept working on it. And I've overloaded it with like everything I could possibly think. And one day in November, late November, before Thanksgiving, I walk into my studio. I open the door and I realize this piece is dead and it's been dead for a long time and I've been beating on the dead horse for a very long time and I was myself surprised that I didn't immediately jump through the window or something you know because you know academics you know what summer is what you know how precious that time when you can really focus you know on your work is um, and, uh, but it was okay because it has taught me, you know, a huge lesson. You cannot start the big piece with a grandiose idea. You know, you first have to beat, kick that grandiose idea and kill your, what they say to the writers, kill your darlings. Kill the things that have become too precious. Do not get attached because it's not going to work. Um, and so that willingness to kind of discombobulate things and so on, it, it, uh, I mean, not that it hasn't happened before and not that it hasn't happened since, but that is one of the takeaways. Don't, you know, when something works horribly, when you feel that you have invested a ton of time into nothing, you know, uh, that's not a bad thing, except in relationship. Run away from bad relationship right away. This is, a, uh, the, the, this is the age old advice. Um, uh, but when it comes to your artwork, every failure is going to teach you something. Maybe not that day, shed your tears or whatever, um, but it's going to be very valuable, you know, because it teaches you resilience, it teaches you the need to go back to things that have become a little too precious, a little too self-important, and kill them. So, <clears throat> okay, now that we have talked about uh, that, another thing that preoccupies me is a great deal, you know, what this Migrant Universe series has become was really kind of a series of landscapes that double as, uh, and you know, each landscape is really, when you think about it, it's, it's a form of a self-portrait, right? So, um, so what I'm very interested in, I, at, at about, you know, I, I was studying the, you know, both medieval manuscripts and, um, you know, Persian or Ottoman. This is from the Ottoman Empire, but might as well be called, 
you know, Persian, because Persians were hired by the Ottoman court to uh, do this. So this is the, this is the 15th century um, um, uh, manuscript. Uh, I think it's the Layla and Mainun, the love couple that appears in the, you know, in the Persian stories, you know, quite a bit. And there's something um, incredibly interesting to me about the way spaces, um, uh, actually 16th century, about the way the space is treated. I mean, this is a time of great exchange between the Ottomans and Italians and so on and so forth. If you haven't read My, uh, My Name is Red by Orhan Pamuk, I strongly advise you to read it. It is all about the making of the manuscripts on the Ottoman court and all kinds of things around it. Because making of the manuscripts was also a collaborative effect. There was not one illuminator. There was a horse specialist. There was a gilding specialist. There was a decorative border specialist, and so on. But um, so, you know, there are these hints at perspective. You know, sometimes figures are made smaller or larger. But, you know, there are many other considerations that go into what's going to be bigger and what's going to be smaller. Like, for example, if you are you know, if, if you are depicting, um, you know, very important, you know, figure, they cannot be smaller than, I don't know, their servants or something like that. Um, and then, of course, um, you, uh, one, of my, one of my favorite, you know, hobbies, is, if you will, is to look at how different cultures captured amorphous, hard to capture things such as clouds. So here are the classical intestinal clouds of the, of the I, I call them Pan-Asian intestinal clouds because before they appear in work from, you know, uh, Chinese, uh, China and Korea, the Arabic, the Persian manuscripts and so on, all the way, you know, into the Balkans. And, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm very, you know, I'm very affected by works of contemporary artists such as, you know, Julie Mehretu, if you will, who kind of encourage me to, you know, Julie Mehretu is the, somebody who does, um, how, how should I call it, this deconstructivist, you know, um, abstraction, if you will. If you look carefully, this is a gigantic piece, I believe. It was in one of the Whitney Biennales. I can't even remember the year, you know, anymore. But it's one of those pieces that have affected me deeply because it invites you to come very, very close and look at the details, but it also encourages you to go back. So this act of looking at, at the work is sort of you are and your mind is in perpetual motion between the bigger picture. Um, and if you, you know, if you look at it, you're going to see the logos of the companies here. You're going to see the, um, uh, you're going to see the city plans uh, from the mid-century for African, you know, cities when there was this great hope of, you know, you know, we're going to create a new Africa and modern Africa, you know, before it all revealed itself as another Western um, grand theft of the continent. Um, it, you know, uh, and uh, and then not you know, and not so much contemporary artists such as Albert Durer. Probably one of the prints that most ink ever was spilled on on divining, theorizing, and um, deconstructing and analyzing and what this piece is about. Melancholia is a uh, as a lifelong depression sufferer, this is something also that um, uh, that you know really interests me. The mini it's probably the figure of Minerva, the goddess of learning, ultimately sitting or having a moment of sitting defeated um, with the compass in her hand, you know, with philosopher's stone, with. Um, with the sleeping dog, with the, um, you know, with the tools of the building and, uh, and art and so on, with that weird rat, you know, spreading that banner um, uh, with the title of the print, Melancholia. Um, 
s something that these, that, that these pieces have encouraged me, I mean, there are many, many other influences, but we don't have time for it, you know, here is, to go a little crazy. You don't have to. Sometimes we overthink things when we are working. Sometimes what, what's, most, what's more important to kind of get in touch, kind of crawl into your own strange self, if you will, and let it manifest itself and just, you know, do things a little bit automatically and then analyze later. So I will go through these, um, through these pieces. Fortunately, their sizes and titles are um, here, and maybe just talk about one of these briefly. Um, so here is a piece that where um, actually, you know, uh, this detail here, it's actually the you look at it closely this is just the fire the equivalent of a halo from an image of uh, Muhammad uh, being taken to heaven by um, by the, uh, the, the the horse with the with the human face so what I'm just taking out is um, this halo behind it and so this is probably kind of a central piece of this whole um, cycle. When you work on a cycle, this, this ended up being 10 pieces that are, consist of one, uh, two, or three of those five by five feet panels covered with uh, paper and then worked on. Um, and uh, when you're working on something like that, that, I don't know, I felt like I was working on for my first novel after a lifetime of short stories or something like that. And, uh, and I quickly discovered what anybody who attempts to write their first novel quickly discovers, that it doesn't go where kind of sit down at the computer or at a piece of paper and you write your first chapter and then a second chapter and so on. It never works that way. You know, you, you get to the second chapter, you realize that you have to throw out the first chapter, then later on you realize that your fourth chapter is actually your first chapter and that first chapter should be the last chapter and that sixth one also needs to be torn up and thrown in trash. And, um, so, you know, this is a little bit how it went. I had this grand plan that I'm going to be done with it in two years, and I was done with it in five years. Um, <clears throat> you know, another thing that happens with these things, and many of these have been kind of resurfaced, like that other, you know, piece that I was working on. What I do with my failures, I, I, I reject a lot of my work and uh, discard it, but not before I harvest it for organs, which means um, take out the pieces that might have worked and that might be working for something else. Um, see the printmaker see this um, see this black hole thing happening here does it remind you of something it keeps coming up it's uh, it's the simplest I will show you the image of just the graphic you know representation linear presentation of graph hole it keeps happening and I take it and I stretch it and put it in the Photoshop and it's kind of like a pizza dough a little bit and um, it just keeps coming back. So and this is the last piece. Um, this is the last piece of the cycle. And, you know, something that happens also is that things can be, things in, in a single piece can mean many things. The, the drapery, the banner of sorts in this one is both tribute to all the historic paintings where, you know, the banner with, you know, um, with some proclamation or saying what is depicted, I don't know, Battle of Alexander the Great winning something and so on. So it's both a tribute to that hist his grand historical, you know, paintings. And it was also simply, um, 
uh, tribute to my father who died that year, who was physician at the same time, uh, who was physician. And, um, you know, I grew up with a father who was a uh, cancer researcher and, uh, and a physician. So my first idea of sublime was looking into his microscope in the study. And to me, that was the first idea of most beautiful, uh, most magical environments. And what I was looking at really were breast cancer cells. So, um, so this work is sort of a tribute to him. He had, at the time of his death, you know, he had multiple cancers and um, he, his head had to be bandaged because he had these wounds that wouldn't, you know, heal and he, it embarrassed him and, you know, the doctors are horrible when they're sick. Um, it embarrassed him, he hated it, he sort of felt oppressed by it, he raged against it. And when he died, I sort of thought that I'd throw that rag out into the air, you know, uh, in his honor, uh, now that he's finally liberated from it. Um, so, and now for something completely different, as Monty Python said. Um, in 1913, you know, I traveled to Sarajevo to do some research in the libraries and the museums that were closed after the war, you know, be because of the damage and the war, and then later on, um, because of the basic abject neglect of the, you know, government that was uh, impoverished, of course, but was also deeply corrupt, and it still is. So these photographs are, I've been photographing, this is, um, this is like Sarajevo's equivalent of Museum of Natural History in New York City. And um, there's no, the ministries at that time was not, um, you know, giving any, um, how shall I say, <laughs> funds, uh, you know, funds to it and so on. So I have basically joined this effort on the part of many, many people around the world, this organization called uh, Culture Shutdown, um, that basically worked on shaming both the Bosnian government and shaming the you know, uh, United <laughs> Nations and other governments uh, that have let something like this you know, happen. The curators in this museum, which doesn't have heat, doesn't have uh, water, so, you know, in Sarajevo winters, the pipes are breaking and things are being further destroyed. I have talked to curators who did not get their salary for 13 months or longer. And when I asked them why, why, they work, why they were bothering to get up in the dark mornings in Sarajevo and go to work, and each one told me, because I just cannot bear to see it further, not after the war. I can't bear to, I, I'm trying to do what I can to preserve it. So, and this is the cycle that has given me this, you know, great fragmentation of the, of the culture that once existed. Um, this is the former Museum of Revolution, now Museum of the History, just a jewel of mid-century, you know, modernism that is just left to, uh, this is the building that's now being renovated and that uh, museum that I just showed earlier is being, um, uh, this is the depot, you know, Museum of the Revolution from the guns from the 20th century. Um, in the Museum of Literature and Performing Arts where my mother was a curator, um, so the manuscript part that you see over there on the far end for me is, I put my hand on it, it is, a, is a manuscript of the book by Ivo Andrić, the only Nobel Prize winner from the former Yugoslavia, in states of former Yugoslavia. And this is, this is the manuscript of his masterpiece, The Bridge on Dream And I, when I put my hand on it, it was cold, it was damp. It was kept in the storage that was basically damp uh, because it, the temperature wasn't, you know, regulated. So I have, um, I worked on this um, photo essay and sort of created this number of, you know, photo collages, which have later, you know, really played a big role in um, kind of changing my thinking about photography and how I use photography in my work, one of the things that I find most difficult um, is combining pho photography with 
hand painted, drawn, you know, and elements. And they kind of stepped into this. This is the, this is, um, this part, one part is the photogravure and the other part is acrylic and pen. Um, um, so, um, I wanted also to show you what the floor of my studio looks like when I'm thinking. So this is the image of my brain, basically, when I'm working. And it's uh, um, everything, every fragment that I have gets drawn across the floor. And that is how uh, thinking starts. And it is those manuscripts that I was mentioning um, you know, before that have encouraged me to play with things, you know, with illusion, if you will, and then step back from that illusion and to kind of trust the fact that image making creates its own narrative that is kind of in the situation of counterpoint, musical counterpoint with your intention, if you will, and with the things, with the reading, with the theory, with what, what have you that you bring, you know, into the piece. These are very small, um, these are very small drawings. Oh, and then there was this um, residency in Ireland where I went to the local store and decided to start putting wiggle eyes into my work. Um, so for the longest time, after I finished the migrant universe, it was the scariest time in my life because I felt like, like the sea has gone out and left the dead animals, you know, strong on the beach because I was just simply exhausted. That cycle really exhausted me. And whatever I've preached to my students, well, sometimes there will be downtimes and so on. You know, I've entered this fairly unproductive, you know, time. I thought it was unproductive. What I was doing, I was writing poetry. I was working on these photo essays. Um, what I was not doing is new big pieces by Tanya Softich and new complicated prints by Tanya Softich and I felt terribly, you know, unproductive. But I was doing these pieces, uh, which kind of finally came back like those guys in the, um, um, in the sky, in the Star Trek and formed themselves into this. I, I, I titled it 49 Notes of, on Being There. It was, I think I finished it like on the eve of my 49th birthday or something like that. And, um, and you know, they have and decided um, to keep them one piece. It will never sell. Everybody's always asking me, will you sell the individual ones? And I will not. I will starve, so. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to go through these images quickly. Actually, you can see these pieces in person. There's no point in looking at them. They are in the print studio and also in some of the. Um, but these are some of the recent pieces that I've been uh, working on. Mushrooms have always been in my life as something, as kind of a symbol of something cheerful. The only thing that we could do happily and harmoniously as a family when I was young, which was, you know, harvesting mushrooms, foraging for mushrooms in the mountains around Sarajevo. And also, I, I worked on this after I read, um, if you haven't read that book, drop everything you're doing and run out and get the Anand Singh's uh, mushroom at the end of the world on the possibility of life in capitalist ruins. Where she, um, oh, where she writes about, I'm not going to go into this but too much, but she writes about the Matsutake um, uh, uh, mushroom, uh, both biology of it, the social, you know, anthropological kind of aspects of mushroom trade, because this is the mushroom of the disaster. Matsutake is the, fur, is the most, it's more expensive than truffles. Um, it gets like five, six hundred um, dollars per pound in Japan. It is considered, the smell of this mushroom is considered to be the aroma of the fall in Japan. Um, it is the first species that came out after Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, bombings. It's a mushroom that needs a ruined so soil in order to. So it is found where there is a lot of logging. 
it is found where you know the uh, land has been stripped by the uh, land has been destroyed by mining or architect uh, uh, and, and it is sort of the first inkling of life that is you know beginning to you know uh, beginning the cycle of life that that starts again Matsutake has become extremely rare in Japan because Japanese are not logging their forests um, as much. That has been outsourced to Indonesia, that has been outsourced to um, Philippines, but we are logging a great deal. So you probably know you are living, you know, here in the West, but the prime uh, ground for uh, harvesting of Matsutake in our Oregon forests, especially forests that are, uh, that are uh, not forests, not the virgin forests, but the land that has been logged, the, the land that has been completely stripped. So, and, and people who are harvesting it are Hmong um, fighters who have, you know, people who have fought on our side and uh, uh, Vietnamese who have fought on our side, you know, during the American side, you know, during the war, the um, Laotians and so on, um, are the, it's sort of, they're, they're, there's, they're interesting communities that are formed through this, hunting of it. The, the buyers are usually uh, Luo uh, Chinese, the, then you know they work with the buyers in Japan, so she describes all these networks kind of dependent on capitalism, um, kind of growing around the king body of the, the contemporary capitalism, um, skirting it if you will. Um, so anyway, she, she looks at the worlds that are centered around this mushroom and trade of this mushroom um, in a ways that, that kind of bring the biology and ecology and um, sociology and anthropology together in this fantastic way. I mean, I recommend anything Anit Singh writes, she's a goddess. These you can also see, they're here. And I just want to show you one more thing because I know Justin really wants to see these and students sh should see these. Last, uh, two years ago, uh, uh, almost two years ago, I got this grant and I traveled to Japan. Um, I was becoming increasingly interested in working in Mokuhanga, Japanese water-based you know, woodcut. And um, I was doing some research on it and I really, really wanted to do um, these large prints in, um, in Mokuhanga, uh, but I really didn't want to go and do the workshop and um, so it didn't quite have time. So April Vollmer, who's the, who has written a Mokuhanga print workshop, sort of a textbook in English on um, history and method of working on Mokuhanga, put me in touch with this wonderful printmaker, Katsutoshi Yuasa. Invite him as a visiting artist. He's amazing. Um, and um, so I, I talked to him, I emailed with him, and I said, okay, so I want to do this. He just opened his collaborative studio where he you know, works, either teaches artists how to do it or helps them realize the prints. And so I, emailed him and I said, I sort of want to do both. I want to produce these big prints, but I want to be your apprentice and I want to work on it. So I did work on it and I did help, although you know his carving was uh, about 99% faster and better than mine, obviously. But here we are uh, working in the largest sheets of Sheena, you know, which is that lightweight, beautiful, um, Japanese plywood, um, and here's Katsutoshi holding one of the images. So these are also, these you can see these prints in person in the print shop if you stop by, but here you can see them, you know, being made. I love this picture because he looks like a fisherman holding a big tuna. <laughs> um, 
But um, um, this was a three-week project, another fast and furious project. At the end of every day of carving, I would go back to my bed and breakfast, the Rio Con, and I would dip my hand into the ice water. Um, and, um, and then the printing started. I thought, oh, thank God, now we are printing. You know, we are done carving. Ha <laughs> ha. So here we are, as, as many of you know, um, the Japanese woodcut is not different simply because you're, it's, it's water-based. It's also application of the ink is different. You applied, it's carved much deeper than the Western um, woodcut. And you basically print with pure pigment diluted in the water. And it's really the sizing in the paper that acts as a binder. You, you work from the kind of a moist plate with a moist paper, so, um, and that's how you get that impression. And then this is the printing, folks. It's like, you know, that um, Corot's painting of gleaners where they're working. Okay, I have felt like a gleaner. You work on hands and knees and you put in, you know, all the force of your upper body into your knuckles and this barren, this disc that you are printing with. And, um, oops, and here are our, um, here are our, so this is what I was talking about to printmakers, how you need to kind of watch for when your residual concepts fail. So you have seen in my work that I insert a lot of these sort of, um, auxiliary, you know, I I I inner images, you know, if you will. And I've tried to do that here. You can't see the image on it very well because of where it is. Um, and I realized that didn't work. That just really didn't work. So, um, but of course mushrooms did. And, <laughs> Chiogra uh, and Chiogami paper did. So um, this, uh, here's the little fuller um, Argonavis or Argonaut ship um, constellation, which is actually not an official constellation, you know, anymore. Um, and the, um, not the Matsutake mushrooms, but the mushrooms that I photographed in, you know, Virginia, the, um, uh, the so-called turkey tail, I'm blanking out on the Latin name, you know, now. So this is, this is something that I have done um, after I have come back to my studio in Richmond, and I was afraid that um, Katsu, would, when I sent him his printer's proofs, when they were finished, would, you know, fly over and kill me for doing this after all the work, but... Um, Anyway, he, um, he said, oh no, I love it. I love working you know, with people who are not, uh, you know, I get so many people that come in and they think that Mokuhanga is something sacred. It's not sacred, it's a means of making art. So he's really terrific. Um, um, and so all of these, um, actually two, not all three of them, you can see in the shop. And this is my last slide. And obviously, I'm a very chatty person. Thank you all for staying with me. And I'll take questions. If you can. <laughs> Yeah. And just see what else in the chat. So if anybody has something now. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Mine will be very simple. Fan of Proust? Maybe? Um, yes, I am a fan of Proust, of course. So I'm also a fan of Madeleine's cookies. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's. Uh, Obviously, I'm not the first person in the world preoccupied with the memory and, um, and, and uh, how do things that have disappeared, you know, um, uh, kind of persist and how the way we tell stories faithfully or not so faithfully preserve and not just preserve really, but actually make the memory the sort of a generative, you know, thing. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yes, a fan of Proust. So. Mm -hmm. um, little quick question. Who was the author of the textbook you were talking about? April Vollmer, V O L L M E R. And she's on Instagram and Facebook, and she's the friendliest, most wonderful person, and it's very w worth following. So, yes. yeah. 
<laughs> she's lovely. She's the, yeah. I love April. So, and it's a really useful book. It's both a history book, um, you know, I mean, it's not a history book. It, you know, it gives you a little overview of, um, you know, what Mokuhanga was, you know, used for and um, its place in Japanese society, you know, about, you know, contemporary applications of it. And it's also a very friendly how-to uh, manual that will, that's good because it gives you good alternatives, you know, if you don't have every rarefy tool, you know, that you might want to have. It's actually, you know, as Katsutoshi would tell me, Mokuhanga is simple. You know, it was designed to be simple. It was designed, you know, we, we think of Mokuhanga, we think of Hiroshige and Hokusai and Utamaro and the Ukiyo-e and the floating world. It was used for printing, you know, basically equivalents of today's tabloids, you know, gossip, you know, in Japan or, or theater, um, you know, sort of publicity materials for the famous actors, if you will, or pornography or, um, um, you know, propaganda, all kinds of things, you know, and um, Anyway, so I came back, you know, to my classroom with a whole bunch of little plastic barons, you know, for, uh, you know, very, very cheap alternatives to professional barons. But it's something that, like, most every Japanese kid has in their backpack, you know, they, it's done all the time. It's, it's uh, you know, it's the Westerners that uh, approach it as this, you know, sacred Japanese, you know, spiritual thing. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not. It's, it, it, it came out of, you know, depiction, need to depict the vibrant life of the Edo period, and it's, it's, it's this regular thing, you know, in, in Japan, so. One more, maybe, if not? Yes? Um, the mushrooms, are you drawing into those before you kind of print them out and piece them out of their shape? No, I mean, occasionally I can say that, I'm, that I don't manipulate them sometimes in the, in the Photoshop, but these are, you know, um, these are uh, pretty much my straight photographs, and thanks to my wonderful students from whom I have learned everything there is to learn about Photoshop <laughs> and other things. Um, other things, I have learned a wonderful, wonderful tool of magic lasso, so I can go around all of those, you know, as I can go all around those intricate, you know, little things and, and pull them out. And, and when I first started working in them and embedding, embedding them into prints um, and other works on paper, I thought this will never work. This is, this is a completely insane idea, but heck, you know, let's have some fun and so on. And I was, um, I realized that, you know, there's, there's, I don't know, the mushroom is such a phenomenon. I grew up hunting, you know, uh, mushroom foraging. As I said, my mother was very, you know, good at it, and she has taught me to, you know, recognize different mushrooms. And it's always, it, it's always like this little surprised photo, you know, kind of photoshopped into the world. And, of course, the most natural thing, you know, that could be, you know, happening, this little miracle, this little terrestrial um, equivalent to, I don't know, crazy stuff that grows underwater and lives, you know, underwater, and if you will. And I was sort of surprised how kind of integrated <coughs> they come to me, to my eye, you know, into the images. So, yeah, I do a little bit, but very little. I mean, it's just, you know, general shot, and then I kind of clean out the other non-mushroom material from it. These particular ones are, I mean, this is just, this is around the corner from my house when trees are dying. These are the mushrooms that start growing, you know, around the bottom. I was, I walked by the tree in the new batch of them. They kind of come out in the spring. Somebody has carefully scraped them, you know, off the tree and I'm like, can't stop the time, the tree is dying. Um, <laughs> you can keep trying. But uh, it, it's the, you know, it's the acids that these mushrooms produce that will kind of give nourishment to the, to the um, uh, organisms that are going to turn that wood into something else and kind of start the cycle again. Okay, I think we have to draw it to a close.
Thank you very much again. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay.